called an immediate flood was four miles around us, the heart of Tel Aviv. The rest of the country is more or less burning. What was the Jewish army? Well, I'm afraid the Jewish army was not something to take home to mama. Our, uh, the top commander of the Jewish army, the, the high general, the top commander of the army, was a 28-year-old archaeologist by the name of Igael Yadin. This is the top commander of the Jewish army. We are talking about 40,000 boys and girls. Every four of them has one rifle, no tanks, no artillery, no petrol, no money, no food, not enough uh, supply, and no hope to bring help in the immediate future because the Brits are blocking the shores of Israel. We cannot bring help. And behind the scenes of what was going on here, you had a dramatic meeting between the two leaders of Israel, Ben Gurion, David Ben Gurion, and another lady called. Not another lady, a lady, <laughs> one man and a lady, Golda Meir, that was sitting here during the ceremony. He called Golda Meir to his office. It is March 48. The situation is very bad in all fronts. They know that the Arab countries will eventually invade Israel and join the war. So we will have to face another five hour armies. And he called Golda Meir to his office. I read her book called My Life. She describes this meeting is one of the most dark and grim and sad meetings of that war. Ben Gurion was, 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 was very worried, he was very, he said to Golda Meir, I don't know, can we survive this? This is his words, are we going to survive this one? And then he said the sentence that she quoted in her book, he said, the way I see it, our only hope now lies with the Jews of America. And I have decided to go to America to do some fundraising and to raise money. Because the official United States did not support the intentions of Ben Gurion to declare independence. They really believed that this is suicide. Everybody knew what is going to happen. On May 14, 1948, the Brits will evacuate the Middle East. And then five Arab armies, not any more the local ones, Five modern, organized Arab armies will invade Israel from all directions with hundreds of thousands of people, with airplanes, with artillery, with any size of supply, with petrol, with money, with tanks, with, with whatever you want. The situation was so bad now as it was before the invasion that the, 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 the chance to survive such an invasion was like less than zero. There is no way that a group of people armed with sticks that are hardly holding against the local Arabs here will survive against five modern Arab armies that will invade in one time from all directions and the distances are very short. The Jordanians are already on the walls of Jerusalem 50 miles from here. The Egyptians had to cover 70 miles from the shores of Rafa to Tel Aviv. That's it. 70 or so. The Syrians came down from the Golan Heights, you know, to, took the Sea of Galilee on only source of water and doing their way to the Galilee. It's like 100 miles from here. What you have is five Arab armies on top of what was going on here, advancing to Tel Aviv at the range of somewhere between 60 to 100 miles from here. And we, you know, and I told you our army was not something very sophisticated in those days. The top general is 28, so the generals in the fields are 24, like for example, it's Hak Rabi, the guy was 24. One of our pilots was 17. What is the age of the troops? And so he called Golda Meir and said, the official America will not help because they do not believe that what we are doing is, is, is possible. And the English will not help because they are living and they are against the independence of the Jewish state. And nobody will come for the rescue, and we need money to buy arms in Czechoslovakia, and we don't have the money. And the only place where we can actually ask for money and receive help is the Jews of America. So I have decided to go on an urgent mission to America to raise funds. And then something happened. Called a I think the first and the only person that kept his job and said no to David Ben Gurion. 
<coughs> she said, no, you cannot go. And the guy was, what? You cannot go. You are David Ben Gurion. You cannot leave Israel now. And Ben Gurion said, who else should go? They know me. They respect me. And she said, I will go. I was raised in Milwaukee. I know the language. I can speak to them. And, and Ben Gurion goes, but you have two kids in the front. 16-year-old Sarah in a besieged village in the Negev Desert, she could not reach her. And 19-year-old Menachem, who chose to leave his university in Manhattan and join the guard forces around Jerusalem. The most terrible battle was around Jerusalem. Two of them survived. You have two kids here, said Ben Gurion. You cannot leave. And she said, I will go. Let me go. And Ben Gurion said, you do not understand. The car is downstairs. If you go, you go now. There is a convention in Michigan. You must get there in on time to speak to the Jewish convention in Michigan in those days. And so she came to, I think it was Chicago, and she wrote in her book many years later how she came to Chicago with my one and only black dress, how she froze them because it's always cold there, and how she had only 20 bucks in her purse, and how Ben Gurion said, don't bother to return if you do not have at least $25 million with you. You have few weeks. Congratulations. <laughs> and she came and it was like, she didn't know what to do. She didn't know where to start even. The long story short, she returned to Israel six weeks later. And she failed. Raising $25 million is a lot of money. So she did not return with $25 million. Instead, she brought $50 million. Five oh, fifty 50 million for people that she never met. And she brought stories of how she met Jewish communities. Maybe, who knows? Maybe your grandparents. Maybe your friends. How she met <laughs> Jews that came to see her. And how she, she met people who offered their jewelry to help with tears in their eyes. How she met people who showed her Papers on their back, they took mortgages to them. It was a lot of money, a lot of money. And the money was used, every penny. Every penny was used to buy a house in Czechoslovakia. And the, the big boats with, with, the, with the weapons that they bought that came to the shores of Israel at the other half of, of June 48 and really changed the picture completely. So it was uphill for us from the late June 48. But all the way till late June, we have to somehow survive here with what we have against the local arms. In the eyes of Ben Gurion, May 14th, 1948, is the day. There is no other day. The Arabs invaded Israel on May 15th. The British left on May 14th. Somewhere between these two events, we must make a move, said Ben Gurion. For 2,000 years, this land was in the hands of foreigners. It is the first time that the, that the, the country will be left with no ruler whatsoever. The British left, it's a vacuum situation. Who's the ruler? The British are pulling out. The Arabs are still not in Tel Aviv, said Ben Gurion. I refuse to despair. We have only two options here. One is to surrender, and this is not an option. Surrendering is a luxury, you remember this. It is a luxury. If your name is Germany, you can start a war, be responsible for the death of 60 million people, and when you are tired, you say, I'm tired, I want to go home, I surrender. And then you have this scene <coughs> at the battlefield where you have two generals coming from both sides, they will shake hands, drink coffee, somebody will sign somewhere and everybody goes home. That's what happened in Europe, the First World War. Exactly what happened in the Second World War. The Nazis, when they were tired or whatever, when they lost, they simply said, we want to surrender. And everybody went home. Exactly the countries they just left behind them, as if nothing happened. So why did you start from the very first beginning? This is when you surrender, that's what usually happens. But here it's the Middle East. We do not have this action. We cannot say, okay, we surrender, and then they will shake our heads, we drink coffee, and that's it. If we surrender one time, game over. And finito la commedia. 
or in your language, people from California, hasta la vista, baby. Yeah. <laughs> this is what will happen to us. There is no option to surrender. It must be a win-win situation every time. Every battle, every war, we must win. 100%. There is no other option. And Ben Gurnan understood perfectly that the only way is to fight. Fight with what we have. We cannot explain that war even until today. I mean, we pretty much know how to explain most of it, but not those crucial weeks when the British left and the Arabs invaded before, before the supply came from Europe. Few crucial weeks are still in the darkness. And we cannot explain it even until today. How tiny villages stood against the armies how sticks won tanks. We cannot explain it, even until today. I'm not a religious person. I don't believe in miracles, I'm sorry. What can I tell you? I live in Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv is more or less a liberal city, more or less, yes. But, and, I, and I'm a teacher, and, and I know the history of my people, very good. Some parts of the other half of May, 48, are still in the darkness, we cannot explain. So this is how it was, in one of the darkest hours of Israel, when Arabs are marching to Tel Aviv, <coughs> Ben Gurion gave orders to throw a party in Tel Aviv. And that's what you call a chutzpah. <laughs> and this is how it was. Okay? Now why in Tel Aviv? Because Jerusalem is besieged. And since they know, 100% know, and that's exactly what happened by the way, that the Egyptians are about to blitz Tel Aviv, an air attack is on the way, they chose this auditorium for the ceremony of independence. To look around you, you will understand why this place was chosen. Not the most appropriate auditorium in the city. Not the best place, believe me, they had to squeeze 400 people in here, as I told you. Terrible. But this is the safest auditorium that they found in the city. And you know when an airstrike is on the way, you want to do your ceremonies in a long offer. You want to even try and keep it as a secret. So that thousands of people would not swarm the streets. Just look around you here. Half high windows with bars behind them. Just see where you are. The heavy, thick concrete walls, the stairs goes down into a kind of a basement. What is this place? An emergency exit there, two stories above us. What is this place? It's a bunker. That's what it is. Now it was there. It was there. Main gallery, the main auditorium of the Art Museum of Tel Aviv, <coughs> built by Mayor Dizimov in the 30s. But this gallery had the qualities of a bunker, and that's the reason why they chose to do it here. You really want to know how the war in Europe was over? Read your books, Google, end of the war in Europe. You know how it was, war, it was over? In one scene in the heart of Berlin, a scene that took place inside the bunker of Adolf Hitler. When he understood that the skies are falling on him, and it is all over, he decided to commit suicide. And he gave orders to all the people that surrounded him to commit to do the same. And he shot himself, thanks God. And I think I know what was the two last thoughts in his mind just before he shot himself. It sounds very kitschy and dramatic, isn't it? But I think you know the thoughts as well. The first thought was, well, it's all over. I'm losing. That's it. That's my end. My, my coward general the trader. It is all over. What was the second thought? That maybe brought a smile to his face just before we pulled the trigger. You know what was the second thought? Show you. You want to try it? You want me to try it? It's just a theory. Well, he said to himself, probably, but at least, at least I have done one good thing in the benefit of the human race. I have devastated the Jewish people for good. They shall not rise again. Who knows, maybe this was the thought. Maybe not. The fact is that the answer of the Jewish people came three years later for well from a bunker in Tel Aviv. Ben Gurion stood here, and in a way, 
between the lines of the Declaration of Independence, he was saying, we are not devastated. And you watch us because in the next 60 years we are going to build here one of the strongest, most modern, stable democracies on the face of Earth. And you know, Golda Meir, because I want you to understand that this is what was going inside the hearts. They were sitting here thinking about the six millions, thinking about families that they lost there. Golda Meir wrote in her in memoirs many years later, she wrote, I couldn't stop crying. My heart was broken. I simply could not stop crying. I thought about my children. And then I thought about the six millions. This is too late for them, I thought. We came too late. But deep inside, I knew it is not too late for the next generations. That's what she meant. This is what was going inside their hearts and minds. So they came here, turning an ordinary art gallery into the Hall of Independence. They borrowed chairs, these very chairs, some of the chairs there as well, from cafe shops around the neighborhood. These very chairs are borrowed, never to be returned, it seems, together with the carpets. <laughs> they borrowed from shops outside here. Everything was done very quickly under a thick layer of secrecy. The orders of Edmund was to keep it as a secret. An airstrike is on the way. We do not have the time, and it won't be, be wise to throw big festivals here. So, so the invitation to the ceremony was left only on the 13th of May. Just 24 hours before the event, this is the issue date. And it says here, Dear Sir, we are honored to invite you to the ceremony of the independence of the Jewish state 